Okay, so welcome back to another video. So today we have a little um, alternating series we would like to verify, and that is that 1 minus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 5 minus 1 over 7, go on so so forth with the sum, it actually converges to pi over 4. So this actually has a special name. This is actually known as the, um, this is Leibniz's notation for pi. Of course, discovered by the mathematician himself. Um, well, the, pr the proof of it is um, from Gottfried Leibniz. Um, first published by him in, the, um, in 1676, this is also known as a special name known as the Leibniz Madava series, which is a more special case for a more generalization um, series expansion of the inverse arctangent function. And it was actually first discovered by the mathematician um, uh, Madava of saying gamma gamma in the 14th century. So there's actually two ways to prove this, but actually those two proofs that I'm going to discuss is actually not today's video that proof it. I'm actually going for another method that um, I'm sure that everybody would um, use the same way when they approach this um, if they want to prove the following. Um, so first proof, you could the first way to say that if you want to prove it is by just saying that if pi pi over four is actually equal to just arctangent of one, just use you know the integral representation of arctangent of you know one. Then with the series added with that, um, you'll also notice that eventually later, if you actually just apply the squeeze theorem as n approaches infinity, then you actually just get the following result like so of the Leibniz series. And another one to say is that if you actually use one of the series expansion and say that it converges uniformly, if you take some f of z, um, for example, and set that as arctangent of z, use that integral representation, then of course by applying with that series expansion, if you just say that f of z approaches f of 1 and it, um, it's continuous and converges uniformly, then you're pretty much done with the proof. Um, now there's some interesting things with convergence and um, there's also a little section that um, it has some unusual behavior and it involves doing with the expansion of um, the decimal expansion of pi and the way it's truncated that if you expand it out there are some um, digits that's not in the correct place uh, when you um, perform the um, when you perform that ex the decimal expansion out. Um, I'll leave that out in the, in the, the um, description below if you want to read a little bit more about this. This is basically just from the Wikipedia of, of you know, Leibniz's notation for pi. That everything I just said, but I just want to give a little bit of a rundown. Um, so basically, all I want to say is that today's um, proof is a little bit different compared to the ones that I just discussed. It's basically you just start with maybe a little, just start not maybe you start with a generalization of some function over some rather than um, it's all actually really just manipulating with algebra, specifically in the world of complex analysis, and then getting to the part that if you set um, a little technique, of course, if you set if you equate like the real parts to the imaginary parts, that's basically how um, this is going to go down. So anyway, um, nothing more to add so, so we can just jump ahead. In. So suppose we actually consider a, um, a little generalization. I'll call this capital S. So we'll say S is equal to the infinite sum starting from N is equal to one of sine of N times X and then divided by N. And of course it's also worth mentioning that X can be um, a real number. So you might be thinking, why do we want to start with this generalization right here? Why, why pick this generalization in particular that we want to show? Well, if you notice closely that if I were to plug or substitute x for pi over 2, so, if I, um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to show you the expansion and see um, why this is a good choice to use. So if I just plug in x equals um, pi divided by 2, so here we would have pi times n divided by 2, then this is divided by n, okay. Then what you'll notice is that if I just apply the, um, so if I just expand this series out over here, so the first term we would have is just um, sine of pi over 2, then divided by 1, add this with sine of, um, so it's 2 times, so it's, it'd be just pi, then divided by 2, add this with sine of 3 pi divided by 2, and divided by three. So if you just keep going on so so forth, 
then um, you'll notice that for every of the even terms with the period, if you have um, sine of pi and then every periodicity with plus k pi for some k is some integer, you notice that those terms are just going to vanish to zero. And then anything with uh, pi over 2, so it alternates from both a negative and a positive. So sine over pi over 2, that's actually just 1. Then it's um, sine of pi over 3, that's actually uh, negative 1. So we have a negative 1 over 3. So you just continue on so forth. It's like it cycles around so for, for every of the odd terms. So plus 1 over 5. So every of the even ends you choose, they're all going to equal 0. So then minus 1 over 7, then plus 1 over 9, and then plus so on and so forth. It should be a minus rather because it alternates, but you get the gist. It's all the summation. But this is exactly what we're getting. This is exactly just like the given above that we want to show that pi it's equal to pi over 4. So this is a good, gen good choice to use for that generalization over here. So we're going to start with that. And then another thing to note is that um, if we use um, Euler's formula, so we know that Euler's formula is defined, or it says the following. So we know that e to the power i times x, that's just equal to cosine of x, and add this with the imaginary unit, and then um, sine of x. Then, we want, then we'll notice that if we say um, e to the power i times n times x, that's just equal to cosine of n times x, and then add this with i times sine of n times x. It uses is just um, the Morvier's formula, rather. Then what you can say that um, for sine of n of um, sine of n times x, then that's just basically we're just taking the imaginary part of the Euler's formula. So here we have that. Um, I guess I can write this in a different color. Then we see we see that sine of n times x is actually just equal to the imaginary of e to the power i times n times x, right? Then if we just substitute this back in, so that would actually entail that saying that s is actually just equal to the imaginary part of our infinite sum. So n is equal 1 of e to the power i times n times x and n divided by n. Okay. So, um, so that's a good way, that's a good um, process that we're, we're go heading towards so far. So now, um, next is we want to use the following McLaren series. If I can just get to the reach the marker. So now the McLaren series we want to use is, um, so let me first write the, um, the name. So we know that if we want to use for um, the natural log of one subtract x, we know that that's actually just equal to um, the negative infinite sum. And that's actually starting from what n is equal to one of x to the power n and then divided by n. So if we just use that, so we can actually, now we can pay attention to the infinite sum that's in our, you know, our imaginary argument. So we don't need to worry about the imaginary like equ equating yet. So before we get to that, we'll take a look at the input first. So then I would have to mean the infinite sum. So over here, the infinite sum, n is equal one of e to the power i times um, n times x and n divided by n. Is simply you just plug in the following. So this is a um, because it's a negative over here, so just by negative both sides. So it's the negative natural log of one, and then subtract. So put in your input. So in this case, this will just be e to the power i times x. You can also write this a little bit further and use to apply the Euler's formula and say that it's just equal to the natural log of one subtract cosine of x, and then subtract the imaginary unit times sine of x, like so. Okay, good utilization over here. So. Now, the next thing to do is we want to note some followings when it comes to dealing with complex numbers. So this is pretty basic to that, um, that everybody learns in the introductory, introductory course of um, complex analysis when you're learning about complex numbers. And so what we say is that for some um, complex number z, so for, I'll put this, z in the world of complex numbers, so z is equal to x plus some imagine u times y, for x times y is a real number. Then you can also write um, z as the following. You can also write this in terms of the radius and then the uh, multi with the multiplication of Euler's formulas. That's with the um, the polar form. That's the other word to say it. R times e to the power i times theta, where indeed r is your radius, which is your distance. So it's your distance between your two um, the numbers of your complex number. So it's x squared plus y squared. And the input argument for you know um, theta, so that's just your arctangent. So this is your arctangent 
of your two inputs of y and n divided by x. But now you'll also, if we do a little bit more manip uh, manipulation over here, if I just take the natural log of both sides, so that means I have the natural log of z, and then if I just take the natural log of r to the power or times e to the power i theta, then using um, you know your rules of natural logs, it's just equal to the natural log of r, and then add this with um, i times theta. Okay, so now we just plug in the following. So for z, if we just put in z for our complex now, um, complex argument right here. So if z is equal to one, um, subtract cosine of x, then subtract i sine of x. Then we would know that um, from these two inputs over here, we would have that r is just equal to the square root of one subtract cosine of x quantity square, and then add this with sine square of x. And then the next part would be that we have to find what our value for arc um, for data is. So data is just equal to arc tan of y. In this case, this will be a negative sine of x and then divided by with the real part. So that will be one subtract cosine of x. But we could also write this a little further and say that um, this can be equal to the negative, um, the negative arc tan of sine of x and then divided by one minus cosine of x, utilizing the fact that arc tangent is actually an odd function. So you just move that negative to out here. Okay, then we just have everything. We just need to just plug in the pieces together. So now let's do that. So now we just go back and reiterate and say that the infinite sum, so um, n is equal one, and then e to the power i times n times x and then divided by n. So we know that um, we just using the McLaren series that we showed over here, so it's a negative. So now just multiply that negative back to over here. So we have the negative um, natural log off the square root, but we have the square root, so I'll just move the one half outside. So this will be negative one half, then ln of um, one minus cosine of x quantity square, and then um, add this with the uh, sine square of x. And then the next part, just add your um, your value for data. So um, see the negative, so that'll change it and now that'll become a positive. So plus i times arctan of sine of x and then divided by one minus cosine of x. Now what we can do is we can actually just take the imaginary part. So let's see, I'll put this back as s, which we said that that's the imaginary part of our infinite sum over here. So n is equal one e i and x divided by n. So we just equate the um, imaginary part. So take this, equate it with this piece. So therefore we showed that just from the um, equating the imaginary parts, I just said that so many times. We have that this is arc tan of sine of x and then divided by one minus cosine of x. So now we a little bit have a leeway to work with here. It's nothing like dealing with the entire, you know, complex number. We're only equating the um, imaginary parts, and this is what the following result shows um, so far. So now the rest is just home stretch. It's very easy. So um, okay, so we set that from earlier with the generalization. We just plug in pi um, divided by two for x. So that's pretty just standard for and just say just plug pi over two to x um, over here. That'll still be s of course. So now s is equal to, um, so I guess I can put this back again, s equal to the infinite sum, n is equal one. Um, now just plug sine of pi divided by, or pi times n divided by two, and n divided by um, n. So that would mean we would have, so basically we just found our little close form of the generalization. So now we just plug x equals pi over two back here. Do the same thing onto the right hand side. So we have sine of pi over two and then divided by one minus cosine of pi divided by two. And now um, the, the next couple um, steps are basically just using some trig identities. So what I can do is now I'll write arc tan of um, now this will be two times sine of pi over four then times cosine of pi over four just divide this by one and then subtract now cosine of pi over two will substitute that as one minus two times um, sine square of pi over four so simply we just use the identity for the numerator we can write 
um, we can use the identity that sine of two theta is equal to two times sine theta, cosine theta. And then for the denominator, well, for cosine of pi over two, we can use the identity uh, for cosine of two pi is equal to one subtract two times sine squared theta. Now from here, so now we have arctan. And you'll notice that uh, one minus one cancels, distribute the negative, so it'll be a positive. The twos cancel, sine pi over four, one of the terms cancels, so we have a cosine of pi over four divided by sine squared pi over four. In other words, that's actually cotangent of pi over four, but I'm actually gonna write this a little bit differently. I'll write this as one divided by tangent of pi over four. You'll see why this is a lot easier to write it this way. So now the next step is because this is the um, reciprocal argument. So now we can actually use the identity and say that and be careful for this. So this is actually equal to pi over two, subtract um, the arc tan of tangent of pi over four. So be careful. Um, you, you can use this um, identity if your um, value of x, x equals tangent pi over four, is has to be strictly greater than zero. Otherwise, if it's less than zero, then this is actually gonna become a negative pi over two, and then the same thing over here. Well, with a different input that is less than zero, of course. Then you'll notice that tangent of pi over four, that's just one. Take the arc tangent to that, it's just back to pi over four. So you'll see that pi over um, two subtract pi over four is indeed just pi over four, which now we just verify that the series is indeed this value, converges to this value over here. And just like that, we are done with the proof. Just like that. All right. So I hope you learned, um, I hope this, this proof was an uh, um, interesting, well, rather, a more, um, a more intuitive and more descript descriptive method. Um, I'm sure the other two proofs listed on the Wikipedia page is interesting too, but um, I hope you guys find that interesting, rather I should say. But I hope this actually gives a little more insight and more leeway on, on an easier approach on um, to validate you know, the following series over here that Leibniz um, proposed, or rather proved. So yeah, that's uh, pretty cool if you ask me.